Hi, and welcome to Anna University's Brain Awareness Week podcast. The following episode is part of the student-led series on stress, how to manage it, and how it impacts our brain. Hey everyone, here is Bettina from the Stress Management Podcast. In case you don't know yet, this podcast series is recorded by a team of Arden University students, including undergraduates like myself. And we are doing this to create a hopefully enjoyable and interesting content for the Brain Awareness Week event. With me is my co-host, Fawn. Fawn, please feel free to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Fawn. I'm a psychology undergraduate and I happen to be Buddhist so I have a strong interest in the intersection of mindfulness and psychology. Great thank you. So our guest today is Kieran Oakland who is here to talk about mindfulness and its applications related to stress as well as to other clinical issues. I know Kieran from my studies as he was my tutor on mental health and quality research modules and my first encounter with the idea of mindfulness was when Kieran introduced it during one of the lectures. He even guided us through a five-minute mindfulness meditation so I knew who to turn to when our team decided to create an episode about mindfulness. So Kieran, can you please briefly introduce yourself? I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, my name is Kieran. I'm a lecturer at Arden University. And at the moment, I'm teaching mainly in neuroscience, so um, biological and cognitive psychology. But as Bettina said, I've wandered into mental health and illness, qualitative, other quantitative research methods as well. And I'm currently, well, I mean, I'm in love with mindfulness. Um, it was going to be my PhD topic, but my PhD, PhD topic is actually going to be looking at toxic behavior in video games. So I've, I've had a bit of a split there. I see. Quite the change. Yeah. Quite the change, yeah. <laughs> but that can happen. So, um, first of all, thank you for being here with us today. And I guess that some of our listeners are already familiar with or might have heard of mindfulness before, and they might even practice it regularly. But to those who do not know, could you, Kieran, please explain what mindfulness is? Absolutely, yeah. So and I'm sure Fawn will uh, correct me or, or have more detailed insight than I do especially from the Buddhist perspective. Um, but normally what I would say is that mindfulness has two main components. The first one being present moment awareness. So being aware of the present moment. And then the second point is being acceptant, you know, being accepting of that present moment. So there's, in, in my estimation, there's the, the two kind of universal things there. So you've got the present moment and then being accepting of that present moment. If you don't mind... I would also like to ask some personal questions before, like, how did you get caught up in practicing mindfulness? Um, well, I like to be an open book, so I'll, I'll be very, very open with, with my own experiences. So I had mental health um, issues of my own when I was an undergraduate, and it was toward the end of my BSc in psychology. And I had no idea that I had problems um, and that I was struggling to cope. And it was actually my dissertation supervisor um, that mentioned that I might be, you know, highly anxious or very, very stressed or, or have depression. So I went home and did some Googling, you know, as a student, you, you know, living on the internet and looking around doing some reading. Um, and that kind of led me to reach out for help. Um, some of the help that I reached out to, um, such as CBT, um, didn't really help. And being a psychology student, I thought, well, you know, I've been on a clinical psychology module. Let's go and read. Let's read the literature. And um, I found mindfulness and did some reading and did some practicing and tried to keep an open mind. And it saved my life, really. So, I mean, over that summer, after, my, after I finished my undergraduate degree and before I started my master's, I was meditating between two and six hours a day, every day, um, really trying to internalize the theory, um, as I'm sure we'll talk about you know, later on. In this chat, I think a lot of people don't really know what it is or how it works. And I really wanted to kind of immerse myself in mindfulness. So it was kind of your coping strategy, so to say. Yeah, if, if things aren't going great and you've been the same way for a long time, I think it can be very difficult to open your eyes to different ways of thinking and to kind of change your perspective on things. And I think mindfulness absolutely did that. It, it made me re-evaluate the way that I 
thought about life, the way I thought about myself, the way I thought about other people, animals. Um, it just it changed everything really. Um, so it was it was hugely transformative, and that's one of the reasons why I try to be quite um, conservative when I talk about mindfulness because I can quite quickly sound like a madman saying mindfulness is amazing. Everybody needs to meditate because I know that, you know, it's, it's my own personal experience, but it really was, um, you know, that pronounced and that profound for me. Yeah. I think it must take, you know, certain, certain mindset to decide at all. And okay, I, I'm going to go for mindfulness. I'm going to start with it. You know, I think. Yeah. And there's a quote from, um, Russell Brand, who's a, a UK celebrity who's had issues with addiction and various things in the past. And in his book called recovery, um, or it might've been in an interview that he did, but he was asked, what do you think gets people involved in, um, recovery or, uh, kind of spiritual awakenings or, you know, changing the way they look at things. And he said, crisis, you know, normally you've got to hit the bottom before you can start to come back up again. So um, there's some interesting research actually on people who have experienced trauma that has led them into practicing mindfulness, because if your life's great, maybe you've never needed, you know, to, to think about how you view the world or think about where your place is in the world. Um, and I, you know, maybe I'm lucky then that my life sucks you know, and things went wrong for me and, you know, it led me to find mindfulness and I'm very glad that that happened. Oh, well, um, is there someone then who influenced you or is it was more like only you and yourself? You did it all alone. You learned how to, how to meditate using mindfulness or was there someone who was like influencing your mindfulness practice? I think, I mean, at the beginning it would have been the power of now and I'm sure Fawn is well aware of that um, by Eckhart Tolle. So that's one of the big, you know, pop uh, popular books on, on mindfulness and meditation. And so I, I read that book basically cover to cover and I had the audio book. So I would meditate and listen on audible to this and really try to let it soak in, you know, instead of analyzing everything, just let it marinate like I'm swimming in mindfulness. And from that, I would then meditate without the book. And I would just kind of, I'd spent my whole life trying to understand everything and being very scientific. And I what quickly in the book, I realized that mindfulness isn't, you don't need to believe in mindfulness. There's a lot of really objective truth in it. And there's also a lot of neuroscience evidence. Um, so I kind of tried to trust the process and spent a lot of time on my own meditating, um, which is why I think I get quite angry sometimes reading the literature um, because I think everyone's perspective is very unique and personal. And there's a lot of I would have to say frauds, people that are talking about mindfulness that don't really know um, sort of how it works or what it what it should be used for or whatever. Um, and there was a guy that I took part in a short course as part of somebody's PhD. So it wasn't, you know, I wasn't paying or anything. I was going to do them a favor. But as part of the PhD study, I had to listen to some mindfulness workshops, which was great for me. It was free, you know, and they were talking about how you know, things now are being sold for money. You know, how can I turn this idea into a profit and, you know, turn it into a commodity? And he referred to it as being muck mindfulness, you know, like McDonald's and this kind of capitalist idea that wow. the idea should be kind of sacred. And we're in the West, we're very quick to try and make some money from it. And I think that's what turned me away from uh, things like that. Yeah, well, that's understandable. I mean, yeah, it might have been quite offensive, you know, to hear some people's um, viewpoints. <laughs> um, Absolutely. So earlier you mentioned you meditated between two and six hours a day. That's that's a lot. Yeah, well, I, I was a student. I had the time. And um, I think where I was at the time, I was very, very unwell, you know, mentally. I was really, really depressed. And it was a case of... I, I need to do that and I need to put the time in. And I think coming out of the other end of it, um, and I'm sure people can relate to this that have dealt with depression or anxiety, when you're out of the other end of it and you look back, you're A, very, very proud, but B, you quickly realize that it's some of the most difficult things you'll ever go through. So when I finished my undergraduate degree, obviously a degree is very difficult, but going through anxiety and, and, you know, severe depression, that was difficult. And I think that was what made my degree hard. I don't think it was the lectures or the coursework. I think it was dealing with life around it. Um, 
So I, I felt like I had to put the time in, you know, if you learn to drive and you only spend, you know, 10 minutes every three weeks, you might not learn to drive for a long time. And if you're learning a language, you need to be spending a lot of time. And I think mindfulness is very complicated, as simple and beautiful as it is, it can be really complicated to, you know, to get it. And I think you've got to allow that time to let the ideas kind of click. Um, you can't force mindfulness. It's like when you tell someone, try to relax. When you try, it doesn't work. You know, you need to kind of let it happen. So do you still have any schedule in your daily life for your mindfulness practice? I'd love to say I meditate every day. Um, and I'm sure I sound like a complete lecturer when I say I don't have any time. <laughs> I do have time. Um I, I try to be mindful in the things that I do. And I actually, I was at a social gathering not too long ago and I ran into one of my old lecturers and she said she, I mean, she's really big into mindfulness and she said she doesn't meditate anymore, but she tries to live mindfully. So I think whilst I don't sit down, you know, to meditate as much as I would like to, I try to approach the world mindfully and when things go wrong, as they always do in life, I try to sit down then and think, okay, how do I look at this properly? Instead of getting caught up in a hurricane of emotions or, or, or you know, whatever, I think I should sit down more and do it every day. So, you know, like I mentioned with learning a language or whatever, you can, you know, watch a YouTube video or you can have, you know, I will sit down for half an hour every day, you know, before I start work. Um, so at the moment I'm, you know, I'm a bit of a fraud myself. I don't meditate as much as I think I should. But you kind of like, as far as I understand, like kind of applying it to everyday situations when you, when you face stress, for instance. Yeah. And it, it's like, uh, it's like any skill where it, learning it for the first time takes a lot of energy, but I think once you're, once you're rolling, you know, once you're moving with it and you understand the concepts, you can you can kind of just maintain, you know? Um, so I notice if, if I don't meditate for a long time, I, I notice it, you know, like if, if someone's really tired or really hungry uh, you know, and you notice they change. You don't want that. Don't, no. Yeah. And then if I don't meditate for a while, I can notice that things, you know, like an email, I might read it and think, Oh, are they really angry at me? Or, you know, I start to get caught up in my own mind about things. And then I, that's my kind of prompt of, I, you know, I should be meditating. Um, so I, I try to be mindful, um, but it is something that I think has utility for everybody. You know, the world is very stressful that we live in. And I think mindfulness for me at my lowest ebb, you know, really, really helped me. And I should use it even now, you know, where I am happy um, because anything can happen. And I think it's very important to be mindful you know, on a, on a day-to-day -day basis and not just use it when things go wrong, but just to use it generally. Thank you for sharing some of your, um, like sensitive history. It, it gives a lot of perspective on why people would, you know, seek out mindfulness and try to think differently about the situation. Um, I do have my first disagreement and it's not as a Buddhist, it's as a student, mm -hmm. two to six hours Free? No way. I don't believe that. That was your sheer willpower. Yeah, I was a lazy uh, I don't student. even do that much. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask a question about, um, you, you mentioned you were um, trying to live mindfully, which is awesome. And more people should be doing this. It's one of the things I think would make it more accessible to most people. Um, instead of trying to live like a monk or looking at how monks are and thinking, oh, well, I can't do that. I'm, I'm busy, you know, yeah. trying to just eject it into your daily life. So I've got a question now with your um, understanding of mindfulness. Can you identify any areas in your life where you were mindful before you knew about mindfulness? This is really interesting. This was something I actually wanted to explore in my PhD because there are people so if you're looking at mindfulness, you can either look at dispositional mindfulness, which is just how someone is, you know, long-term or um, state mindfulness, you know, how mindful someone is in the moment. And obviously both of those can fluctuate over time, but people's dispositions tend to be quite stable. And I know people, and I'll name drop James Bartlett, who you guys probably know, he's a lecturer at Glasgow, um, uh, University of Glasgow, and he's very, very mindful, but doesn't meditate and 
is kind of mindful without realizing it. So if something goes wrong, he goes, oh, that's annoying. Oh, well, let's move on. Yeah, he's very good at being present and he doesn't really hold on to things. Um, so one of the things that, because I was working with him quite closely during the end of my undergraduate degree, and I found it really interesting how the things I was learning when I was learning about mindfulness, I could apply to him, you know, and he wasn't mindful. He was just kind of being mindful. So there are certainly areas of life, um, like you say, where people might be mindful without realizing it or without having labeled it, which I think is really important to seize upon because a lot of people are turned away by the term mindfulness, because again, they've got those ideas, like you mentioned about being a monk or having to go live in the forest, or, you know, you've got to listen to, to chimes instead of music. Um, but there are loads of areas where, you know, we, we kind of, we respect mindfulness when it happens without needing to stamp a label on it. Um, I was mindful in some respects. I've always been quite mindful about, um, like death and illness, you know, things go wrong. That's life. You know, you've got to, you've got to move on. And I lost my father when I was 16 to suicide, which again, I think crisis forces you to, to kind of deal with things like that and to come out the other end with, you know, hopefully some wisdom um, along with the scars and everything else that goes along with it. And um, so I think in some respects I was quite mindful without having labeled it, but I think mindfulness is so universal that when you start looking at the whole of your life, um, there's so many areas that are kind of toxic, you know, that it might be really small, like the way that you talk with, you know, one of your family members might not be healthy and you can start to then apply mindfulness to that very, very, um, you know, in a very focused way. Um, so I noticed that when I started to meditate, all of my new experiences were great, but I had to go back in time and apply mindfulness to the rest of my life. So all of my relationships and the way I viewed food, the way I viewed the internet, the way I, the way I viewed money. Um, so I think there is definitely benefit to kind of looking at normal mindfulness without the label, but I think definitely is a skill um, that people can pick up. It's really, really important. And it, you know, it definitely was for me. Interesting. You, you bring up the, um, well, when you, when you mentioned your, your uh, father passing away, it made me think of how before my mom passed away, I, I didn't understand why it took people more than a year to mm -hmm. stop like immediately crying at the, thought of it of them but now that my mom's passed away I realized part of grieving is being mindful you're suddenly really mindful of the fact that oh I used to think about them and want to tell them stuff all the time and you know all these things around me have memories and and remind me of them but when they're there and you you kind of take it for granted you're not mindful of how much they're impacting your life and it, sometimes there's this um pressure to just keep moving, keep going, go, you know, shoot forward, never really looking back. So we have some pressure to kind of get past grief quicker. And that's like, and make yourself more productive and grief is looking behind and it's bad, but actually maybe that's a good thing. And, and sitting in that space is a good thing. And it's not just making yourself sad for no reason. It's honoring those feelings. And, um, well, it's kind of what you do in therapy as well. You need to sometimes look back and process these things and sit in that moment and it helps you move forward as well without leaving a bit behind yeah um, absolutely i think like you said creating that space and i think if if something bad has happened and you think oh well immediately move on no i feel bad right now i'm still in that state of something bad has just happened like i know it's not still happening because presently it's gone it was in the past but i'm still living the effects of it and i need to process these before i can then move on so i think um you know, some of the misconceptions around mindfulness are that you're a robot and you can just go through, you know, loss and tragedy and you just keep moving like a, like the Terminator or something. But in reality, you, like you say, you, you get, you can honor those feelings by thinking, okay, well, actually today I'm in a bad mood and that's all right. I'm not going to force myself to be happy because I'm not. And I think a lot of the kind of Western way of thinking or, you know, the kind of CBT way of thinking is now I'm going to force some happy thoughts in there and I'm going to wrestle and I'm going to resist. And I never found that useful. So I think having the permission to feel bad when I feel bad, having the permission to grieve when I need to grieve, and then also have permission to laugh when you start feeling happy again. You don't need to feel bad. Now, I remember feeling quite guilty when I laughed for the first time after my dad had died. And I thought, am I allowed to be happy after what has happened? You know, surely that's disrespectful, but mindfulness allows you to move 
at your own pace. So I think it's a really nice way of helping you to navigate those major life experiences that unfortunately we all go through. And I say, unfortunately, actually it's, it's neither fortunate or unfortunate. It's just life, isn't it? Um, but it, it helps you to navigate those things. And, and it's really, really important because those things can, I mean, you mentioned one year, it took me nine years <laughs> to, to get over my dad dying. I was an absolute mess. And I think mindfulness at that time would have helped, um, you know, not necessarily speed up that process, but it would have helped me find the answers I was looking for more quickly instead of walking around in the dark. Yeah, well, you know, it also took you kind of big of a courage to, you know, be honest with yourself. It might have helped a lot with that as well. Um, I'm going to skip a question because you mentioned misconceptions of mindfulness. Um, and yeah, we, we should talk about that. What, so what are some of the common misconceptions of mindfulness? Um, well, when I first started meditating, I spoke to a very close friend who's not academic at all. And she said, oh, so is it going to change your sense of humor? Are you suddenly going to be very, you know, it's just life. Don't worry about it. A tree is a tree. And, you know, I'm not going to label anything and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I said, no, actually, I feel more connected to people and things and ideas and even myself. And so I think one of the big misconceptions is that you become quite blank. And I remember actually a podcast with Sam Harris and Stephen Fry. And Stephen Fry said his problem with mindfulness was he didn't want to turn into a cow. You know, a very, you know, simple creature that, you know, just eats grass you know, that just walks around in a field and doesn't really know about literature or, you know, arts or politics. And I, I remember I listened to that after I'd uh, started studying and practicing mindfulness. And I thought that's not how it works. I, I can appreciate things more now as a result of uh, practicing mindfulness. So I think that would be one of the big ones. And I think one of the other ones is that when you meditate, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to relax or you're trying to do anything. I think mindfulness isn't, it shouldn't be a cure or a, a kind of preventative measure for something. It should be, you shouldn't try. You just, it, it's about the process and not the destination. So if I, if I think, oh, I need to sit down and meditate because I'm stressed, that's not really the way to do it. Um, so that would be one of the other large ones. And I think one of the big ones practically that stops people is when they sit down and they think that suddenly if they sit in the right pose and they put their hands in the right way, that all of the answers will just come into their mind. Um, when in reality they sit there and they think, okay, I mean, it's been two minutes now what? or they sit there thinking and they think that that's useful. The idea is to try and limit thoughts and just be present. So there's a lot of I would say there's a lot of practical misconceptions about actually practicing mindfulness, um, such as that you need to sit down or you need to do a particular practice. You can be mindful when you're driving. You can be mindful, you know, what, no matter what you're doing, you can go for a mindful walk or you can eat mindfully. You know, it's, it's not really about the specific practice. Um, and then there's, there's also theoretical misconceptions, you know, what mindfulness is supposed to be doing. Um, and the way I thought about it when I was learning was if I'm learning to drive, they don't just put you in the car and say, good luck. They teach you some theory. You do some theory first and then you do the practical. Um, and so for me, learning about the theory really helped me to get over some of those misconceptions. So I didn't just sit there on my bed and think, what on earth is going on? Am I supposed to be hit by lightning and suddenly be happy? <laughs> you know, what, what am I, you know, what's supposed to be happening here? So I think there's quite a few um, but I think they differ, you know, depending on, on the person as well and, and their perspective and what they're expecting. Um, and I've actually got a dissertation student that's looking at barriers to mindfulness. So people that have tried to meditate and they hated it or they didn't really like it or people that have never wanted to try. And there's a lot of misconceptions. Uh, you know, she hasn't finished writing up the paper yet, but there's a lot of really interesting misconceptions amongst people that turn them away. Um, and one of the sort of big ones before you even start practicing or learning about mindfulness is, do I need to become a monk? Is this, you know, is this a religion? In which case, is it anti-science? Uh, because I'm, you know, I'm a psychology student. It's a BSc. I need evidence for everything. Do I need to believe in mindfulness? If so, I'm not interested. Um, so I had a lot of people when I started to meditate saying, I didn't think you would meditate. You're, you like science. 
And I thought, well, actually, here's here's all the science. <laughs> here's all the evidence. So there's some really interesting conversations there. And I think part of the, the goal of mindfulness is to kind of break down some of those barriers and, and maybe change the way it communicates in certain areas. I, I like the um, example of the car you gave, because you said something that's quite difficult to say just before that about, um, you know, you don't have a goal with mindfulness. You don't go in because you're like, I need to relax. Let's sit down and force this relaxation. You, you're, you want to kind of limit thought. And sometimes people misunderstand what that means and they think you're trying to empty your mind completely. So the car example is a good one because you could sit in a car and be like, there's a million ways this could go wrong. This could set on fire. The phone could blow it up and, you know, like it could crash. And you don't want to not think about those things. You need to think about them enough to put your seatbelt on and be safe, but you don't want to just run away with them and completely put yourself in a state and never actually start the car. And I guess mindfulness would be kind of like that. You, you sit there and you allow these thoughts to come and go and you go, okay, maybe I could work on these later when I'm not you know, when I'm not meditating, but I'm not going to run away with a thought and get carried away. I'm just going to let them come and go. And rather than limiting, you kind of limit by, um, rather than stopping, you just allow. And sometimes people misunderstand the limiting as you're stopping and you're putting the gates and stuff. No, complete opposite. You just let it like, you'd like when you're dreaming, weird thoughts come and go and you don't pay attention to it. That's kind of what you want to do. Um, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, that's absolutely huge that you don't want to be resisting anything so the moment you start to resist something there's i mean that that kind of violates that second thing i mentioned about what is mindfulness you've got to accept what's there yeah. if there's a thought so i mean going back to the misconceptions thing i think being quite visual there are lots of visualizations i use to help me understand some of the concepts because they're quite abstract and they're quite difficult to you can't really write them down on a post-it note and put it on your wall and think oh yeah i get that it's something you kind of have to just feel you kind of, I can explain to you how, how a flame feels and that you shouldn't put your hand near a flame, but until you put your hand near the flame, you won't know exactly what I mean when I say how it feels. There's a difference between knowing something and knowing something. Um, and one of the things within a uh, kind of visualization was imagine you're in a massive uh, kind of party area and you're the host and you've got loads of guests coming and their thoughts or emotions. When they come in, you don't need to go and shake their hand and then hold on to their hand the whole time. You can let them walk around on their own and they will leave when they want. The doors open. They can come in, they can walk around, they can leave. But the moment you start holding on to them, they can't get out. So if ever I have a, a stressful thought about you know, work or things that are on the news at the moment, for example, I'm not going to stop it from entering my head. It just will. I don't have a choice but then I will not engage constantly with it. I will allow it to walk around and it can leave on its own. And whilst that sounds easier said than done, I think when you get into practicing mindfulness and you get into being present, it becomes really, really easy. Um, you know, like any other skill that you learn, like if you're learning a language and you constantly, you can't find the word, eventually you can, you can find the word. And I think with mindfulness, you can allow those thoughts to come and go without you know, without getting so like, oh my gosh, I feel this. What does this mean? This is bad. I shouldn't be feeling this. You can just accept. So that the first thing, you know, the present moment, I, I feel like some people can, you know, most people can get that, but the being accepting of the present moment, I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up and where a lot of the misconceptions are, like you said, around holding onto things or, or resisting or trying to stop um, certain feelings. That's a great example. I like that one. I might steal it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it helped me. I'm I'm not terribly intelligent. So having those uh, visualizations really helped me. So when I would feel stressed, I think, do you know what? They've just come in. They're wearing a nice suit. I think they're really important. But that's fine. I will let them walk around. And when they get bored, they will leave, you know, and that's, that's how it happens. And I use that for job interviews. If I ever felt a little bit stressed, I think, well, actually I'm busy focusing on preparing for my job interview. If the anxiety wants to come in and walk around and then go, it can, but I'm focusing on this, um, but I'm not going to resist. You know, I'm just going to just let it happen. That, that sounds similar to a type of, um, treatment I saw for OCD. I have no idea if this is linked to mindfulness or not, um, but th they just suggest people to accept these thoughts coming in and go, okay, I, I can deal with that if that worst case scenario happens and just accept it because instead 
what people do is try to battle it and come up with arguments against it. And then mental illness brain, I always say, is way more creative than you are. So it will come up with even better (laughs) arguments and you just fight forever. And I find it always wins. Whereas if you go, okay, thanks for warning me. I'll file it. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like, like, oh, I I was heard. (laughs) Yeah, you don't need to get into the dialogues. You can just say, yeah, I'll I'll pop that in the filing cabinet. If I ever need to get to it, I will. But then you'll find that when you go to that filing cabinet later, it's not there anymore. (laughs) There's no problem. So I think that's one of the ways of getting to, you know, a still mind where you can then, I mean, one of the things in The Power of Now says that if you think of your brain as another visualization, if you think of your brain as like a power tool, like a drill, you know, like you press the trigger and it makes the noise, you don't want to just leave it on 24 seven when you need to build something, you get the drill and you drill whatever you need to, you know, drill your mind should be the same. It shouldn't just be active constantly without your kind of uh, permission uh, as it were. So I think getting to that stage where you can kind of point yourself and be present without carrying all of that, um, you know, that's kind of the, I wouldn't say the end game, but that's one of the things that really made my life uh, immeasurably better in terms of the, the sort of quality of experience I had because I didn't have the, you know, the, the mental illness or the mental health uh, voice constantly telling me what was going to catch on fire and what was going to go wrong uh, because it's not true, you know. And you, if you get into the dialogue with it, which is what I kind of learned in CBT, you know, wrestle the voice and make it positive it just left me feeling exhausted. So I think mindfulness gave me that day off. I could just let things, let things happen. So we know that mindfulness comes from Buddhism and um, you've mentioned earlier that it's, well, it's not, it's not really a religious thing and you're not expected to become a monk just because you're practicing mindfulness. So, um, I wanted to ask what you what you understand the differences are between um, mindfulness that we use um, in the Western world versus the religious uh, traditional roots. Well, I'm I'm very torn on this. So, I I had very little exposure to um, the kind of traditional perspectives on mindfulness. So I picked up a pop, you know, popular book on mindfulness and, and practiced it, practiced the, um, what I would consider to be the kind of core components, you know, being present, being accepting, disidentifying and, you know, um, cutting attachments with things and whatever. And to me, those were very secular, you know, very objective, very rational, very logical, and not not necessarily affiliated with any kind of religious practice. Um, It wasn't until I took part in that workshop that I mentioned, and the individual that was delivering that workshop um, is, you know, Buddhist, is really, really knowledgeable on on the kind of historical roots and how the West has commodified um, mindfulness and it's kind of packaged it and it sells it in these various different um, guises, but really underneath it's mindfulness and it's, you know, these Buddhist principles. Um, when I started to look at um, PhD ideas, because mindfulness is something I absolutely love and I think the world needs more mindfulness, um, I found that I couldn't really reconcile the differences in A, what on earth are we even talking about when we say mindfulness? Um, because we don't have all of the different um, translations of the different words, um, you know, from the, the Buddhist kind of teachings and a lot of these initiatives and interventions at the moment are designed to make money which kind of flies in the face of of things like that and then there's the kind of ethical implications of and from what i understand and obviously i haven't done uh, you know a great deal of reading around it since my phd idea changed but the goal of mindfulness is that you get interpersonal connection or into everything connection. You're connected to each other, you're connected to the world, you're connected to history, to the future, you know, you're connected to everything. But in the West, it's kind of, you will meditate so your life is better. You will meditate so you can make more money. And it's very intrapersonal. And I think that's not really the way it was, you know, that's not really the way it should be. Um, and so I I couldn't really reconcile that. And I wanted my PhD to kind of highlight that. Um, but then I decided it might kind of pollute how I think of mindfulness. Uh, and then I kind of thought, well, I think mindfulness is like singing in the shower. I do it on my own and I really love it, but do I necessarily want to get into all of the things? Um, because I, you know, I live in the West, I'm a white male. Um, I don't know if 
I should be the person to be saying what it is or isn't. So um, for that reason, I kind of stepped away and thought it's something I do in my own time and I, I absolutely love and I do it in my own way. Um, but I certainly do think it has been changed or at the very least, the way it's communicated isn't always clear. So, I mean, you know, as students yourselves, one of the big things that we evaluate when we're being critical is what do you mean when you say X? What do you mean when you say mindfulness? The literature isn't even clear on what it means. And the West has kind of come up with its own definitions and has kind of reinvented it. So I, I don't really know how I feel about that. It almost feels like cultural appropriation or you know, it's been kind of taken and repackaged and, you know, all of these things have been taken out and some other things have been put in and then suddenly it's an eight week course that you can take for only 99.95. Um, so I'm, I'm really not sure. And I think one of the other, you know, the flip side of that is that mindfulness can be really, really impactful and really, really good. And, you know, it being secular was what got me into mindfulness. So I think there definitely is a space for, you know, the principles of mindfulness. Um, but then I'm not sure how, how, you know, groups or, or you know, institutions should go about that. Yeah, it's, a, it's a tough one because it's kind of separating culture and religion um, from cultural change. It is kind of a, almost a nonsense question, even though I asked it myself. <laughs> it's kind of a messy one. Um, There's a piece of research or, or at least an article by um, Gordon that kind of mentioned the Mc, Mc, what was it, Mc mindfulness that you mindfulness, mentioned yeah. earlier. And they essentially say that the main issue is maybe not so much in using mindfulness as a non-Buddhist person, but more so presenting mindfulness in the uh, medical field and not letting anyone make an informed decision on something that it does have religious roots by neglecting to mention it, which is probably where, where I would sit. Like if, if we're hiding that information of its roots, that's pretty unethical. But I mean, I avoided calling myself a Buddhist for about 10 years because I was worried that I was kind of appropriating something that I liked because I'm naturally a hippie, you know, I'm always going to lean that way. And it, it took a long time for me to realize, no, I've been in this community for so long. It's, it's not, it's valid for me to call myself a Buddhist. And it, you know, maybe if I'd been brought up in a different culture, I wouldn't have had so long of sitting there on that. And mm -hmm. I question whether I needed to do that. Honestly, I, I do think people shouldn't shy away from mindfulness just because they don't want to appropriate, but maybe, um, giving, giving it some thought, asking some, some leaders of those religions, what they think, if they wear the mala beads that some people would say it's appropriation, some wouldn't, but in terms of sitting down and using the teachings, it, it it's um it depends on what there's there's a lot of types of buddhism so so it, it's almost a trick question i'm sorry it's yeah. it, you know what is this like buddhism buddhism is a lot of things <laughs> so it depends what buddhism you, what kind of buddhism you're looking at it's it's very complex but um oh i think when you said like you weren't sure if you were the right kind of person to write that that research piece that's also a really tough thing to decide when you're passionate about something and you're coming from it from an academic point of view. So you should be able to do it objectively, but it's, it is a, a subjective kind of matter and it's very complex. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, it, it must have really been a hard decision and uh, it'd be cool if you could approach it at some point in the future, but I totally understand why you did that. Yeah. And I think, the, the, the quote that comes to mind is um, there's no such thing as a view from nowhere. You know, everyone's got their own kind of unique perspective. And I, I suppose I can enjoy driving and not want to know what, how an engine works. I really enjoy meditating. I don't necessarily need to get bogged down in all of the, you know, the cultural aspects of it and in all of that, because that's a lot bigger than me. And for me, that, that doesn't really relate to how I practice mindfulness on a day-to-day -day basis. I had enough problems on my own when I was faced with the question of, well, does that make me spiritual now? Because I would have never have thought, you know, but suddenly words, you know, can feel really important. And within mindfulness, there's the whole thing around, well, you shouldn't really be labeling things anyway, because if you 
say a painting is good or bad, does the painting change? No, it doesn't. The words, the label changes, but the, you know, the subject is the same. So I've tried to, you know, steer clear as much as possible from that. And I think stepping away from, you know, looking at it academically is one of those reasons as well, because um, it's something that I think for me is a far more personal uh, pursuit than it is an academic pursuit. And I think reading around it, constantly it might become something that I don't love you know, as much as I do or as much as I should. So far we managed to touch upon the religious, you know, and cultural as well as subjective side of mindfulness. But I would say let's turn to science. So what happens in our brain, broadly speaking, Karen, when we meditate with the mindfulness technique, if I can say that. Where do we begin? Uh, well, one of the things that I was really um, surprised by, positively, you know, I was positively surprised by, pleasantly surprised by, um, when I looked in the literature, was just how wide ranging the impacts are upon the brain um, and how similar some of the changes were to changes that can take place as a result of addiction. And obviously in, in the kind of inverse. So my undergraduate degree was looking at, um, my undergraduate dissertation was looking at addiction. And there was an area of the, the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, which is really important in attention and allocation of attention. Um, and when that region was kind of impaired, that lended itself more to people that were more addicted or would struggle to quit a substance. So issues with attention, basically, where if you're seeing something, can you control your attention away from it? And almost like with mindfulness, where you're keeping your attention present, the anterior, anterior cingulate cortex is implicated in mindfulness, where that area um, is stronger in people that meditate. There are areas of the brain that are to do with learning and memory, which is obviously fantastic, especially as students or people in academia where you're exposed to lots of new information. Um, so a lot of the areas you want to have working properly get you know, helped by meditation. A lot of the areas to do with stress or anxiety, they get calmed down, they get inhibited. So I suppose the big one that most people will have heard of is the amygdala. So the amygdala, you know, absolutely huge in emotion and quite primitive, you know, feelings, especially anger or, or anxiety. That region of the brain, the amygdala, becomes less active and can even become smaller in individuals that meditate. So the inverse of that would be, well, what happens if you are someone that's very anxious and doesn't meditate? Well, that amygdala might be bigger or more active. It might be hyperactive. Um, and certainly for me, who was very, very stressed, I'm quite sure that if I, um, you know, if my brain was scanned pre and post uh, meditation, there would have been some kind of changes there, either in activation, you know, uh, like blood flow or whatever, or structurally in terms of the volume of the amygdala. So I think it's very wide ranging and not even looking at specific areas, but uh, regions that connect areas of the brain, the sort of highways of the brain that carry these messages between regions, they're strengthened uh, when you meditate. So it's, um, it sounds too good to be true, um, but there's so much research out there and the research is getting better over time. So I know, Bettina, you mentioned shifting from looking at it culturally or, um, you know, from a religious perspective. It's, it's very new in the neuroscientific literature. So, um, you know, every I've got Google Scholar alerts where I get alerted about um, neuroscientific research in meditation and mindfulness practices. Um, and I'm always like, oh, my God, like, you know, within the next 20 years, there's going to be so much stuff out there um, that will hopefully allow us to make stronger arguments about using it to, to kind of lean upon things we already know from other regions, like learning a language is good for neuroplasticity. Learning an instrument is good for that. Um, you know, playing games when you're in old age is good to delay cognitive decline. We've got all of that evidence now within mindfulness that can show that it really, it really does something biologically. It actually works. Yeah, it's certainly very promising, you know. Um, so I assume that you would also say that it is very helpful for stress, as you referred to earlier, also from your personal experiences. Yeah, absolutely. So well, I think the, the two regions or the two areas that I would most recommend um, that mindfulness be looked at is around um, anxiety, depression and stress. Um, so depression being, you know, thinking about the past um, and holding on to it mindfulness can let, can allow you to let go of the past and anxiety being fear of the future and all the things that can go wrong and living in the future 
um, mindfulness can allow you to, to be a tourist in the future in the past, but be a permanent resident of the present moment. So I think that those are the areas that for me personally, it's had a profound impact. So you've mentioned how it can help with um, stress itself. Um, are there any other applications to mindfulness that you can uh, let the audience know about? Um, well, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in anything to do with mindfulness, to be honest, but outside of um, my own experiences, I think um, there are some really interesting avenues of research looking at eating disorders and mindfulness. So I know that eating mindfully is one of the practices that's discussed a lot within, um, you know, interventions and things as a illustrative practice to, to show how you can live mindfully. Um, so I know that there's applications in that. I know that um, it's been gamified as well. So things like Headspace. And um, so there are applications in terms of literal applications, you know, on, on your mobile phone to make it more uh, accessible. But it's really wide ranging. I think most things you can look at can have elements of mindfulness in it. And I think it draws upon something you mentioned earlier, Thorn, where mindfulness existed in the world or exists in the world, even without the label mindfulness. Um, so it's about finding those areas where we can kind of deliberately um, kind of enhance our experience through what we know. I know, I know there was um, some kind of uh, like essentially slowing down the steps of the eating process for people with eating disorders. So it's not focusing on just eating a whole meal, but you might just pick up a raisin and you feel it in your hands for a few minutes and then you put it to your lips, but you don't even put it in your mouth yet. Just feel it and maybe smell it. And then you put it in your mouth and you just feel how it feels. Just experience everything without the pressure of you have to eat this. Then you can stop at any point, but you just see what all those experiences are and, it's it's very interesting application. You'd think eating disorders, the goal is you want to eat healthily. So you either make them eat the right amount or the right types of food where this one, like the raisin doesn't have much more meaning than to just be explored. And, and it's such a novel way of viewing things and it can remove a lot of um, or help address aversion. And it might even slow people down to help them find out why they have these disordered eatings in the first place, uh, eating habits in the first place. Um, I, I remember reading that a few years ago and being fascinated and I didn't know about mindfulness back then. So I didn't know if that was related to it or not. It may not have been, um, but it's definitely a form of mindfulness. And it's, it's once you start thinking creatively, um, you really can go a lot of places with it. And you, you mentioned gamification. I think games have a lot of, um, a, a, a lot of promise for therapy, whether it's in mindfulness or not. And the, there's, um, I think it's just called gamify your life or something. There's like a thing on, on your browser you can get and you can put on uh, goals on there and, and then you get rewarded for, you get points of reward, rewarding. Um, <laughs> you get, yeah, you get rewarded, rewarded when you do the, all of these tasks and it's mm -hmm. playing on that fact that it motivates people. Um, and I know there's, there's a research piece that did the same thing and they found that gamifying the meditation, it kind of increased people's likelihood to stick to it. And then that increased likelihood to stick to it meant that they were more likely to see the benefits and um, it reduced depression in students a lot. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a <clears throat> big, big problem with depression with students. It, we have a way higher proportion of depression um, within us for some reason. And um, it's just an interesting way of taking something like gaming, which could be harmful. Um, you know, the gaming addiction is becoming more prev prevalent and turning that into uh something that can be healthy. And I think that goes back to what you were touching on earlier in just having a mindful uh, way of living, looking at the things that you lean into a lot as a, maybe a coping mechanism and thinking, hmm, maybe I can turn that into a positive rather than just a negative thing I hide away into. Absolutely. I think, um, what, I think one of the interesting things there is you mentioned like rewards and I suppose on one hand you could think it's it's not great to be led by extrinsic motivation because you're doing things for the outcome and not necessarily the process. But I think with so many things, if you can get people motivated enough to start and then like you say, they see the benefits, 
they will then have intrinsic motivation. They will sustain that without the rewards. And um, so things like uh, myself trying to take up running, I've gamified my running to help me get motivated to go out running. And then after a while, I don't need the app. I just want to go and run. I enjoy it. But before I definitely didn't, you know, definitely didn't enjoy it. I think mindfulness can definitely be the same where it's not necessarily saying that, you know, we don't need intrinsic motivation and it should all be, you know, reward based, but we will reward you to get you started. And then once the process is in the way, then you can see the benefits and you can continue, you know, maintaining that habit. And that leans into a lot of the things I did in my master's on behavior change, which is, you know, if you're very, very stressed, a lot of what you would have to go about doing is changing your behavior. And then gamification is one of the, you know, one of the absolute, um, you know, most impactful ways that we can do that nowadays, I think, especially where you've got, you know, a mobile phone in your pocket that you can do absolutely anything on, you know, it's a really, really powerful tool. Absolutely. Yeah. So this idea of gamification, you know, of, 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 um, of, uh, of your running, for instance, has motivated you. And um, could you perhaps also mention certain resources that you could think that may be helpful for people to, to learn or start to practice mindfulness, those who are not really familiar with it. But I understand your personal take when you mentioned before that this, this idea of selling it for, for money, this whole whole idea of mindfulness being sold and you know, for profit, I, I can understand it's offensive. But, but you also mentioned there was a book that you find very helpful could you mention some of it, some alternative sources? Yeah, so the, the book that really changed my life um, was The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Um, and I would say meditating with that, by the time I was, before I'd even finished the book, really, a, a lot of my anxiety and stress had gone away. Um, so The Power of Now was really, really impactful. And I know there are um, other books by him, um, I think one's called the new earth and there's another one, um, that I've heard, you know, people really, really, uh, appreciate this based on, you know, a lot of those principles. Um, he's also got a lot of material on YouTube, um, you know, mini lectures or, or, you know, small podcasts or recordings or whatever. Um, there's also an individual called Sam Harris, who I believe, um, has taken part in many retreats and has a podcast where he talks about mindfulness. It's a little bit more academic, uh, but he's got some guided meditations on YouTube. Um, and I believe I used one um, in my lecture that you mentioned earlier, Bettina, um, where he sort of talks through these processes. Um, but outside of that, I, I don't really have any recommendations except for Headspace, the mobile phone app. I think once you once you've kind of gone through some of the theory, most of it will be the practice. It will be the practical elements of just doing what you've learned. And I mean, you speak more languages than I do. So you'll know that you can read a, a million books on how to speak English, but, you know, speaking English is how you get better at it. Um, so the practice really is the important thing there. So I think one of the biggest resources you can have is time to meditate, you know, giving yourself that time to, to practice and, and to allow it to work and not necessarily necessarily sit down on a 30 minute lunch break and meditate for 15 minutes and expect that you're going to float into your next meeting, you know, and that you've turned into a deity or something. It's a process. Also, Absolutely. would you say, is it safe to, to start off alone with a meditation or do you, do you definitely need someone who, who, who guides you? That's a really good question. So I, I started on my own. Um, but I have read papers and there's someone actually from, I believe from Coventry University that's published a number of pieces of research on how we should be careful, you know, with mindfulness, that it's as, as good as it is and as big as the kind of benefits can be and how wide ranging they can be, like you've mentioned with learning and memory, stress, anxiety, depression, et cetera, there are, you know, what's been referred to as the dark side of med meditation or mindfulness where things can go wrong. So for example, if you begin to meditate and you're allowing these emotions in and you're beginning to confront these emotions and start to process them, they can be really overwhelming. So I know in certain clinical settings that mindfulness can be, um, 
you know, it can have that risk. And I know from my time working in a mental health hospital and to touch upon what uh, Fawn mentioned earlier with eating disorders, I was working with uh, patients that had eating disorders or had disordered eating. And the therapeutic modality that was used was called DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. And that was kind of a mixture of CBT and mindfulness. And there was that kind of, it's got to be under supervision. It's got to be very carefully structured and monitored because these individuals have experienced things that very few people have ever experienced. You know, they'd been through horrible, horrible things. And so that doing that on their own would have been very, very difficult or potentially triggering or could have caused more problems than it helped with. So I think that's absolutely a, you know, a valid concern. And there is an emerging body of literature that's looking at well, when should we be careful and when should we not do it on our own versus, yeah, you can just wander off and do what you like. So that's a really, really good question. And I suppose I fell into mindfulness, you know, randomly. Um, but I think, I think it's about monitoring yourself. And if, if you do feel that you're, you're not coping, that you reach out for support um, and that you do it in a structured way, because there's lots of mindfulness practitioners, you know, that you can work with. That goes back to some dis, uh, misinformation or uh, misconceptions of mindfulness as well, because a lot of people think it's just a space where you calm down and you relax and you, you breathe deeply and everything feels good and you can just get on with it. Where in reality, it is about being mindful. So it is about going, I'm stressed out right now. Why? Mm-hmm. what's happening in, in here, what's happening in my body and what's happening in my head. And as someone with chronic pain, it's not certain types of mindfulness aren't recommended for people with chronic pain, which just sounds strange. Like why would being aware of your head affect your body? But if you're in chronic pain, you, you actually have defense mechanisms to shutting off certain parts of your pain because you can only cope with so much. Mm-hmm. And when you do body scans, you, unlock those because you're becoming you're you're choosing to be aware of certain body parts and it can really cause severe pain and it can put you in bed for days and it's it's, I had one once I didn't listen to I didn't I didn't I thought I know mindfulness I can do it (laughs) big mistake I was I had a back spasm couldn't move for three days it was so severe I've never had anything like it and it shows just how much your brain is dealing with all the time that you have all these defense mechanisms you don't even know about keeping you like together. And when you do start breaking those down and going, let's just see what's under here, you are removing a defense mechanism. And if you don't have anything there to, to, you know, replace it besides just sitting and observing you are really vulnerable. You need something to like bring you back to your, your, you know, your state you were at before. You need to find a way to rebuild those walls again. Even if you'd rather not have them all the time, you kind of need them right now, you know, like, and yeah, having a therapeutic space can be a good way to do that. And um, there's, there's probably other ways of doing it that aren't so clinical, but um, yeah, if someone goes into it thinking this will relax me, they're already making a, a mistake there and it, they will get shocked when they realize they I think everybody's way more stressed out than they realize they are. And mindfulness sometimes just makes you confront that. And it's, it can be validating. It can make you feel like, well, I'm doing pretty well considering everything that's going on, but also, yeah, if you just throw yourself in it and do a long period of time of meditation with nothing to prepare yourself for the after effects, it, it can be really hard. Yeah, I think it can certainly be overwhelming. I think that's the, the, the important thing that you've touched on there, that it's not a case of sitting down and, ah, I've just, you know, I, I've had a busy day, but I've sat down and I'm relaxed. It, you can confront things that you might not be ready for. And I think in my own experiences, I I went through various like epiphanies of understanding parts of mindfulness that made it easier to deal with more, you know, more and more and more. But certainly if I'd sat down and meditated and suddenly got confronted with everything, you know, like I mentioned with my dad or with, you know, relationships or with, you know, how I think about food or money or whatever, people carry around a lot of problems. And like you said, people are very, very stressed. And if you're suddenly confronted with all of that at once, it can be very, very overwhelming. And and that can cause you to just run away or, you know, go down that rabbit hole of uh, feeling even worse than you already did. So I think being sensible and logical and taking it slowly, treat it as a very long process and don't think of there being an end point. You know, I'm not sitting down to relax. I'm sitting down to meditate. 
what happens during my meditation, I can't control. I might get up and think, well, actually, I couldn't relax at all. My brain was full of noise and today's just one of those days. Well, that's great because I didn't sit down to achieve anything else. I sat down to meditate and I meditated. So I think... You know, that acceptance is important in that. But yeah, you're absolutely right that it can, you know, it can absolutely depend. And I've got a, um, a joint condition myself, which leaves me in pain most of the time. Um, but I try not to think about it at all. Um, you know, I try to limit my awareness. And sometimes when my partner says, oh, um, you know, what, what's hurting now? I kind of do that body scan and well, my, my arm. And my other arm, my legs, my back, my neck, well, actually everywhere. So I, I completely get what you're saying there, where sometimes, you, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to be hyper aware all the time. Um, and it, you might want to be aware in certain, you know, snippets of time where you sit down and think, right, well, I'll, I'll do it now. Um, and I think that goes back to Bettina's question of, you know, is it, is it always healthy? Is it always right? Um, you know, it, it absolutely depends. And I think that's the big thing in psychology, isn't it? We love to say that it depends, you know, nothing's ever 100% good or bad. It's yeah. always somewhere in between. Yes, yeah, so you are all different. You know, never know how you're going to react to it. Well, thank you so much, Kieran. I think this episode was already very helpful. Like, I feel like I learned so much about mindfulness already. And I'm a layman, totally. I, I don't practice mindfulness. I don't know much about theoretical background so that's why i have you two in this episode um so big thank you for you kieran and for you fun for being here with me today and i hope that those of you who are listening you find this episode very interesting if you would like to listen to more stress and stress management related content from us please check out our episode with dr sharon buckland who is talking about the biopsychological background of stress that is what happens to our brain when we are experiencing stress or you might be interested in our last episode with our guest speaker, Alison Brown, who is explaining occupational stress and is providing great inputs about coping with stress from our work and academia. So thank you, everyone. Stay tuned and enjoy Brain Awareness Week.